Perhaps you have not spent much time among naked men or stood snout to snout with the grizzled bear or dined on dog stew or horse steak or felt the scraping pain of near starvation in the shining mountains of the West or carried the torch of the Enlightenment to the far great falls of the Missouri River, the first civilized man ever to see that sublimely grand object. I come to tell of wonders and of the burden of the wilderness. Louisiana was Thomas Jefferson's personal dream. When he purchased that vast territory from Napoleon Bonaparte in 1803, the Federalists, his enemies, claimed that it was a land of unknown proportions filled with ignorant savages that would never be needed in the course of American history. The Federalists lacked vision. They could not see this democratic assembly in the far northwest fulfilling Mr. Jefferson's dream of a two-ocean continental empire for liberty. The Federalists called the Louisiana Purchase the wildest chimera of a moonstruck brain. But Mr. Jefferson, undaunted, asked me to come out to this great territory to conduct a grand scientific reconnaissance for the Enlightenment, to examine its Indians, its geology, its plant forms, its possibilities for his agrarian dream, and of course, the Missouri River. I was Mr. Jefferson's private correspondence secretary in the White House. We lived alone together for two years. He wrote to his daughter, we live like two church mice in this great box. He gave me a short course in his dream of America and in the Enlightenment, and then he sent me out here with my friend Mr. Clark and about 40 enlisted men. The object of your mission, he wrote, is to explore the Missouri River and such principal streams of it as by its course and communication with the waters of the Pacific Ocean may afford the most direct and practicable water communication across this continent for the purposes of commerce. He urged me to keep a daily journal, to make copies of it when possible, and to submit them into caches or to return them to the United States in case our expedition were destroyed. Let me tell you briefly about the men that I chose to wander into the Missouri country with. My associate was William Clark, in every way my equal. Our temperaments were quite different and we complemented each other in the West. He was a gregarious man, excellent in personnel management, happy on the boats, easily angered, but still more easily reconciled, a man of good temperament who loved Indians and was a natural woodsman. I was a temperamental man, moody, sometimes irascible, given to the depths of melancholia. And while Mr. Clark preferred to stay on the river with the men in the boats, I wandered off alone on shore with my dog, Seaman, my gun, and my journal. Mr. Clark brought with him his Negro slave, York. York was a fat man and lazy. Uh, his skin color so astonished the Indians that they didn't believe it could be possible. I remember that we were in what is now Dakota amongst the Arikara, and a chief, after examining this prodigy of nature, put saliva on his fingers and attempted to wipe off what he was sure was a pigment and only when Mr. York removed his handkerchief and showed his kinky buffalo-like hair did the Indians believe that he was indeed a man of another race. The savages are superstitious, and anything that is unusual they ascribe medicine to. And so they looked upon Mr. York with enormous satisfaction and curiosity. And it was their habit all throughout the American West to offer their women to any man they thought had special medicine. And none of our men was more popular with the Indian squaws than York. Uh, 
I remember when we were in the Mandan villages in what is now Dakota, in a winter that was notorious for its icy cold, so cold, in fact, that our whiskey froze, a thing I thought physically impossible. <laughs> Mr. York came back after one of his nocturnal hospitality rites. and came private, privately to me and announced that he had frostbitten a part of his anatomy that this group is too polite to have mentioned. <laughs> Needless to say, this ended his hospitality rights for some time. <laughs> when we were amongst the Mandan people, York pretended that he was a kind of prodigy of nature, a lucis naturae. He would chase the little children around the lodges they would scream and go under their mother's deerskin dresses. He roared like an animal until Mr. Clark suggested that this was perhaps not the best possible way to advertise the superior civilization of the United States. We had a man named Pierre Cruzat. He was a half-breed, his mother Shawnee, his father French-Canadian. Cruzat was totally blind in one eye from a childhood accident and nearsighted in the other. And yet he was far the best of our marksmen. He could shoot anything. Moreover, he carried his crude frontier fiddle all the way to the Pacific Ocean and back again, and entertained our men at nights with frontier jigs and reels. Drewer, another half-breed, was an expert in the signs of the forest, and he also knew that lingua franca of westward tribes, the gesture language, the talk language with hand signals. This enabled us indeed to communicate with Indians whose languages we knew nothing of. Another of our enlisted men was John Coulter. Young, adventurous, full of energy. Mr. Coulter was so enamored of Louisiana that when we were returning in September of 1806 to civilization and meeting a group of traders moving up the Missouri to hunt for pelts among the Yellowstone, Mr. Coulter asked me for permission to turn back and after two and one half years of the most rigorous hardships, near starvation, quarrels with Indians, Coulter turned back into the wilderness. He, in fact, became the discoverer of Yellowstone Park, what was then known as Coulter's Hell. Well, there were about 40 of us, rough and tumble young men with nothing to lose, no marriages and no children, the kind of men who don't talk very politely in Mr. Jefferson's circle, but who can survive in Louisiana? We left St. Louis on the 14th of May, 1804, in full military regalia, and we returned two and one quarter years later, tatterdemalion in buckskins, our order entirely dissolved by the rigors of the West. We traveled 7,689 miles, 15 miles per day. We carried with us three boats, a 55-foot keel boat, a kind of barge, and two flatboats called pirogues. We traveled with $669.50 worth of Indian gifts, trinkets, medals, calico beads, shirts, handkerchiefs, fish hooks, and some metal which could be used for crude implements among the Indians. The first part of the journey from St. Louis to the Great Bend of the Missouri in what is now Dakota was relatively well-known territory. That is, four or five white people had gone that far up the Missouri River. And so we used that stretch of the expedition to test our men and equipment. On the whole, the equipment tested better than the men. There were a number of courts martial, one for insubordination, two for drunkenness. There was a desertion. And Mr. Willard, this was my favorite, was court-martialed for lying down and falling asleep on guard duty. He pleaded innocent to falling asleep, although he admitted having lain down. We gave him 100 lashes. Mr. Jefferson was particularly interested in our relations with the savages, with the Indians. Now that the United States owned Louisiana, it was essential that these peoples be told that there was a new sovereign in Washington, that we were eager for peaceful negotiations and trade relationships, and most of all, that they must put away their warfare and their nomadic hunting and become civilized like white men. And so we were eager to meet with any tribes we could. In fact, it was their buffalo hunting season, and so it took us 11 weeks before we encountered our first tribe. 
When we did so, we called a great council. We put up an awning from our keelboat and created a kind of parade ground. Our men all dressed in their military uniforms, and we brought in their principal chiefs for a parley. At that point, I gave my Indian speech. I had written this with great care, and I want to deliver it to you now. I said, children, the great chief of the 17 great nations of America, impelled by his parental regard for his newly adopted children on the troubled waters, has sent us out to clear the road. He has commanded us, his war chiefs, to undertake this long journey. You are to live in peace with all the white men, for they are his children. Neither wage war against the red men, your brothers, for they are equally his children, and he is bound to protect them. Injure not the person of any traitors who may come among you. Do these things which your great father advises, and be happy. Avoid the counsel of bad birds. Turn your heel from them as you would from the precipice of an high rock, lest by one false step you should bring upon your nation the displeasure of your great white father who can consume you as the fire consumes the grass of the plains. A noble speech, I thought. Unfortunately, I only spoke English and no Indian languages. <laughs> we had interpreters, but the line of communication was far from clear, and I was never confident that Mr. Jefferson's Pax Americana was finding its way into the savage mind. I remember once among the Nez Perce Indians in what is now Idaho, the line of communication was so convoluted that I doubt that anything was said. I spoke in English. One of our voyageurs, Mr. Labiche, translated from English into French. Charbonneau, the feckless interpreter from the Mandan villages, translated from French into Minotauri. His wife, Sakajawea, translated from Minotauri, her adopted language, into Snake, or Shoshone, her native language. And then a boy of 12, who had spent some time among the Nez Perce, translated from Shoshone into Nez Perce. <laughs> I doubt that Mr. Jefferson could have solved this conundrum. Well, the Sioux Indians were not impressed with my speeches. They attempted to turn back our expedition, and in September of 1804, we had a long and difficult confrontation with that people. In my journal, I called the Sioux the vilest miscreants of the savage race who would never understand the superior civilization of white America until they had been chastised. Winter came on. We headquartered amongst the Mandan villages, a group of more than 4,000 Indians in what is now Dakota. It was an exceedingly cold and difficult winter, but there we met a man named Sheheka, the chief of the Mandan, in English, the big white, one evening in his earthen lodge, he took a stick and he drew us a map of the Missouri westward. We had no idea what lay west of the Mandan villages. He heaped up little mounds of sand to show us the ranges of mountains, and with his stick he traced the river through those mountains. We scoffed at the notion of a savage drawing a map for us, but in fact his map was exceedingly accurate and showed us exactly the Great Falls of the Missouri and its source and the ranges of the Rocky Mountains. At the Mandan villages, we hired Charbonneau and his snake wife, Sakajawea. Sakajawea gave birth to a baby boy named Baptiste on the 11th of February, and she came with us westward in April and carried that baby on her back all the way to the Pacific Ocean and back again. Now, history has suggested that she was essential to our success. This is not so. But in fact, there were times when she gave us confidence because she knew the territory through which we were passing, and she was an expert woodsman. She knew how to extract from the barren prairies prairie apples and succulent cacti and other dainties for our repast. 7 April, 1805, we left the Mandan villages into totally unknown territory. No civilized man had ever been there before. And I wrote in my journal, our vessels consist of six small canoes and two large pirogues. This little fleet 
although perhaps not so respectable as those of Columbus or Captain Cook, are still viewed by us with as much pleasure as those deservedly famed adventurers ever beheld theirs, and I dare say with as much anxiety for their safety and preservation. We are now about to penetrate a country at least 2,000 miles in width upon which the foot of civilized man has never trod. The good or evil it has in store for us is for experiment to determine. And these little vessels contain every article by which we are to expect to subsist or defend ourselves. Entertaining as I do the most confident hope of succeeding in a voyage which has formed a darling project of mine for the past 10 years, I cannot but look upon this day as among the most happy of my life. The men are in excellent health and spirits, zealously attached to the enterprise and eager to proceed. I took an early dinner this evening and went to bed. And so we entered terra incognita. We found, first of all, that it was exceedingly fertile country. There were bison literally by the tens of thousands, perhaps millions, in Montana. It was possible for us to kill enough food to feed ourselves for a week in a 15-minute excursion at the beginning of each day. So tame was the game that I issued a warning to my men not to kill more than we could consume. There were times when we literally had to part the bison and antelope herds in order to move up the river. We were eager to hunt a grizzly bear. We had heard about them from the Mandan Indians. They had told us this astonishing story that when young Indian warriors went out to kill their first grizzly, they were given a funeral first. <laughs> so likely was it that the bear would win. We laughed at this sort of impotence among savages, and I wrote in my journal, equipped as they are with second-class bows and arrows, they may well fear this beast, but we, with our superb rifles, are equally a match for the grizzled bear. That was before we met one. <laughs> Let me tell you only one of many grizzly bear stories. We had killed a young cub. It had chased me 75 yards before it died at my feet. And so I began to send out parties of hunters to kill the bear. The next day, they found a giant bull grizzly in a thicket. Six hunters stalked it. Four of them fired first, and two held their fire in case that bear did not die. The four who fired first shot the bear in its vitals, and yet this only angered it. The bear rose up and roared with its astounding gnashing of teeth. The other two hunters fired. One broke its shoulder, and the other put a bullet into its lungs, and yet that grizzled bear did not die. Our rifles were single-shot rifles, which required a good time for reloading, and so the men were unable to fire again. The bear began to chase them through the thicket. They would hide, load, and shoot blindly. That bear finally had 12 bullets in it, and yet it didn't die. The men now panicked and ran for the river. It was 100 yards away. The bear chased them. When they reached the river, they discovered there was a 25-foot drop into the water. They looked back and decided that the drop was superior to the bear. <laughs> they jumped in. The bear came to the precipice and looked down, roared, and dived in after them. <laughs> they now began to despair for their lives. But the bear, mortally wounded, swam a half a mile to a sandbar in the middle of the muddy Missouri. When it got to that bar, it dug its own grave, three feet wide and three feet deep, roared for 30 minutes, and dropped dead into its grave. We walked up carefully to that site. And when we got there, we discovered that there were nine bullets in vital places in that bear, and yet it had lived at least 40 minutes from our first contact. The meat was no good on this old bull, so we rendered it and produced 13 gallons of bear oil. That night I wrote in my journal, I find that the, that the curiosity of our men with respect to the grizzled bear is pretty well satisfied. <laughs> I must admit that I do not like the gentleman. I had rather fight two Sioux or Blackfeet than one grizzled bear. Well, we pushed on. We came to the Great Falls of the Missouri in July of 1805. I had moved off alone to explore the falls myself, and so I became the first civilized man to sit before that object 
This was the great moment of the expedition, the one that I had longed for for years back in Washington and Philadelphia. The Great Falls were enormously beautiful, 300 yards wide, and the water cascade in, cascaded in one motion 80 feet on a sheer drop into the water. The spray was such that rainbows formed above our heads. The water was so violent that I watched the carcasses of bison hurtling over the cascade and crashing into the rocks below. An eagle soared over my head, and the sound of the water was thunderous. So sitting on a rock in front of the falls, I took out my journal, and I wrote a description of that sublime place for Mr. Jefferson. I described its length, its height, the animals, the feeling of being there. And when I had finished a rather long description of the falls, I found myself involuntarily looking up from the blank page at the sublime sight before me. And I instantly realized that my description of the falls was entirely insufficient. It was not equal to the grandeur of the place. I thought of scratching out my first description and trying again. But I realized that that description and a third and a fourth would be no better and perhaps worse. I ached to be Shakespeare or Leonardo so that I might bring back to civilization some articulation of this great place that would be equal to its magnitude. Yet I could not come to terms with the greatness of the West. In some way, I never recovered from that moment. It took us 31 days to portage around the falls, and although I had waxed eloquent about their beauty in my journal, one of the sergeants whose duty it was to lug our 4,000 pounds of baggage around the falls called them very terrible indeed in his journal. Thereafter, we found our way to the source of the Missouri, crossed the Great Divide. It turned out to be much more difficult than we had expected. In fact, we nearly starved. For nine days, we had nothing whatsoever to eat. We ate our moccasins. We ate bear grease. We ate anything we could to survive. At last, we dropped almost dead into a camp of the Nez Perce in what is now Montana and Idaho, and those savages brought us back to health and put us on our way, showed us a, a thin thread of river through the most forbidding of all American mountains. I remember the moment when I discovered the source of the Missouri. I was with one other man, a man named McNeil. I wrote in my diary, at the distance of four miles farther, the road took us to the most distant fountain of the waters of the Missouri River, in search of which we have spent so many toilsome days and restless nights. Thus far, I had accomplished one of those great objects upon which my mind has been unalterably fixed for 10 years. Judge then of my pleasure in allaying my thirst from this pure and ice-cold water. Here I stopped to rest myself for a few minutes. And two miles below, my companion McNeil had bestrode this little rivulet and thanked his God that he had lived to bestride the mighty and heretofore deemed endless Missouri River. Well, after all that suffering in the mountains, having been helped by the Nez Perce, we had a kind of spree as we came down the Columbia River. We traveled fast. We were eager for the ocean. It was 7 November, 1805, when Mr. Clark wrote in his diary, Oh, the joy, ocean in view. But I must say in candor, that was the last joy we knew in Oregon. That winter, at a crude fort called Fort Clatsop in what is now Astoria, we had five months of the most disagreeable weather ever endured by human beings. In my diary at the end of that period, I wrote that the sun shone on only six occasions in that five-month period, and there were only 12 days in which we were not drenched. On January 1st, as we were thinking about our return trip to the United States, I wrote one of the most melancholy passages in my diary. I said, this morning I was awoke early by the discharge of a volley of small arms, which was fired by our party in front of our quarters to issue in the new year. This was the only mark of respect we had it in our power to pay this celebrated day, our repast of this day was not so bad as Christmas, but it consisted chiefly in our anticipation of January 1st of 1807, next year, when in the bosom of our friends, 
we shall enjoy all of the hilarity and mirth which this occasion promises. And with the zest which comes from the memory of this moment, we shall enjoy both mentally and corporally a repast which has been prepared for us by the hand of civilization. For the moment, we were content to eat our boiled elk and wapato root and to slake our thirst with the only beverage we have, pure water. Two of our hunters who went out this morning came back in the evening having killed two buck elk. They presented to Mr. Clark and me each a marrow bone and a tongue on which we supped. But we returned to civilization shortly thereafter. The last act at Fort Clatsop in what is now Oregon was to post on the wall of that crude log fort a map of the Missouri and the Columbia Rivers that was drawn by my good friend Mr. Clark and some of the principal scientific discoveries of our expedition. We had, in fact, discovered for science 178 plant species never before known to civilized man and 122 animal species never seen before, including the coyote, the mule deer, the antelope, the bighorn sheep, the jackrabbit, the prairie dog. We left that scientific data on the crude walls of that crude fort in case we perished on our way back to the United States so that the cause of science and Mr. Jefferson's enlightenment would not be stillborn. The return trip was almost entirely uneventful. I unfortunately was shot by my best hunter, Pierre Cruzat, accidentally. He mistook me for an elk. And I had the ignominy of wandering into St. Louis on a litter, unable to walk. Mr. Clark and I separated at the mouth at the uh, source of the Yellowstone River, and he floated down that great river, and I pursued a small reconnaissance of the Marias in what is now northern Montana. Before I turn to your questions, let me summarize in the briefest possible way. This is what I had to say to Mr. Jefferson upon coming back. First, the age-old dream of a Northwest Passage is dead forever. We had hoped that there would be a portage of no more than half a mile and half a day between waters of the Missouri and waters of the Columbia Rivers. In fact, that portage required at least 340 miles over rugged mountains covered with eternal snows, and it took us six weeks. This is the end of the dream of the Northwest Passage. Secondly, Mr. Jefferson's dream of an agrarian America filled with simple family farmers thriving in Louisiana will face several important obstacles, the chief of which is a terrible lack of water in the West. It's not at all clear that Mr. Jefferson's small family farm on 50 acres can survive in Dakota or Montana or eastern Oregon. Third, Mr. Jefferson's love affair with Indians seems to me to not be borne out by experience. I find the Indians exceedingly strange and troubling. Their diet and their religion are peculiar and sometimes alarming. Their personal codes are barbaric. It, a young man might cut off his little finger to mourn his dead sister. Uh, there is sacrifice. The Indians of the Columbia Valley squeeze the heads of their babies between boards to produce a kind of conical head. I remember the first contact that we had with the Indians of the Columbia River. We saw a man wearing a top hat and a red scarlet coat. A few days later, we saw a woman with a tattoo it said Jay Bowman. He was now owned by some white trader. The first words of English we heard between St. Louis and the Pacific Ocean occurred not far from here. The savage had only this to say in English, son of a pitch. <laughs> I thought to myself, what happens when these two races mingle? Do we have nothing to offer these people besides prostitution and unscrupulous trading and whiskey and degradation? And have they nothing to offer us but hostility and their barbaric codes? What's to happen to Mr. Jefferson's dream of these races mingling into an amalgamated American race? I found most of my experiences with the Indians of the West unsettling. Well, those were my conclusions. I returned to Washington, where I was a national hero. Mr. Clark and I were charged by Mr. Jefferson to write up our journals. This I never did. Having been named the first governor of northern Louisiana by Thomas Jefferson, I moved back to St. Louis 
There I fell into deeper and deeper melancholia, into alcoholism, and finally to near suicide. And only three years and two weeks after my historic journey to the American West, I took my own life on the Natchez Trace Trail on a journey back to Washington to uh, communicate with the new president, Madison, and the War Department about my vouchers for legitimate expenses in St. Louis. Once you penetrate a wilderness, it is never wilderness again. And having returned from the Great Falls, being the first civilized man to explore that place, I felt that there was nothing left in my life which could ever reach that height of pride and adventure and romance. The West is a troubling environment. Its Indians and its landscape are forbidding, and worst of all, the human pen, the civilized pen, in my view, is not equal to its grandeur and its ruggedness. Well, enough. Let me take whatever questions you have. Yes, sir. Captain Lewis, uh, I've got uh, some references I want to ask you about. On Wednesday, the 8th of January, during uh, the difficult Fort Clatsop stay, uh, your associate, William Clark, and I take it from his quote in the journal, said, arrived on a beautiful sand shore, which we continued for two miles, crossed a creek 80 yards near five cabins, and proceeded the place the whale had perished, found only the skeleton of this monster in the sand. Sir, my question for you is, is that the place we now call Cannon Beach, Oregon? I don't know what you call it, but I can tell you about that whale. Uh, we had heard through the, the Indian telegraph, the sort of grapevine of the savages, that a whale had been beached on the shore, and so Mr. Clark decided to take a group that had never seen the Pacific Ocean to look at that great beast, and if possible, to bring back some food from it. The Indian woman, Sakajawea, came to him quite angry and said, Captain, it doesn't seem fair. I have come all the way from North Dakota, walked over the mountains, nearly starved to death, and now you plan to go to see this great Leviathan and you don't intend to take me. This I will not accept. And Mr. Clark backed down and took Sakajawea with him and her child Baptiste. They made a long journey of it to that whale, but when they got there, they discovered that the Indians of the coast were so hungry that they had entirely stripped that Leviathan and nothing was left but a pile of bones. Mr. Clark later was able to purchase 300 pounds of blubber from local Indians, but at great cost in beads and trinkets. It seemed to me that most of the Indians of the westward slope of the Rocky Mountains were perpetually hungry, and that, in effect, prostituted them whenever white people came into their midst. But what the name of that place is in your time, I cannot say. Other questions? Yes. The matter of the, the missing metal boat at Great Falls, could you, here in this legislature, we do a lot of um, uh, trying to, to get agencies that have been given money to, you know, to do the right thing with that, and it seems to me there was a boat lost, and could you somehow account for your not being able to find that? <laughs> this man is clearly a Federalist. It gets worse, sir. Uh, <laughs> that boat, in fact, was not lost. I'll come back to it in a moment. But I will say that uh, Congress approved the expedition called the Corps of Discovery on the 18th of January, uh, 1803, and appropriated $2,500 for its completion. Before the expedition had ended, I had uh, approved vouchers for $38,700, which I take to be the first case of cost overrun in our nation's history. <laughs> It wasn't clear to me how we would get boats over the Rocky Mountains. I didn't know how high they were. Mr. Jefferson said they were surely no higher than the Blue Ridge. This I doubted. Um, and because I knew that portaging would be a great problem, I designed at Harper's Ferry an iron-framed boat, uh, which could be reassembled there and uh, covered with the skins of buffalo or of elk. And this broad iron frame boat would then float us to the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> 
Unfortunately, I had neglected to procure any caulking compound at Harper's Ferry. When I reassembled the boat, it took almost a month at the Great Falls, and I discovered there was no caulking compound, nor were there any pine trees in the vicinity. And so eventually, we covered them with a kind of tallow from Buffalo, but this did not serve. We put the, the boat into the water one afternoon at the Great Falls, and I wrote in my journal, this boat, which I call the experiment, floats like a perfect cork in the water. That afternoon, it sank. <laughs> and it sank forever. Uh, rather than let the Indians have that metal, we put rocks in the, um, in the boat and sank it in the river and did not make any attempt to recover it on our return journey. I'm sure it's still there if you want to, to wander up and get it. Other questions? Question. Uh. Would you take a look at the names engraved in this building yes. and perhaps share with us some inf scandalous information <laughs> about any of these people <clears throat> that we have placed down in history? We might want to scratch their names off at some <laughs> later time. <laughs> well, it's not my place to tell you how to decorate your great hall. Let me tell you, you've misspelled the name of the Indian woman. That's my only concern. Um, if you look in my journals, you will see that her name should be pronounced Sakagawea. Let me say a few words about her as long as this has come up. Um, she had been abducted as a child from the Rocky Mountains where she was living with her own tribe, the Shoshone, or Snake. She had been carried 500 miles eastward to the Missouri River, and there she had been traded, lost in a gambling incident, to one of the worst men who ever lived, Charbonneau. He had a number of wives. He beat them, he abused them. Eventually, he deserted them. When we came to the Mandan villages in Dakota, we knew that we must have an interpreter with which to obtain horses from the Shoshone in the mountains. And so we agreed to hire Charbonneau as our interpreter, if and only if he would bring his wife, Sakajawea, along. And he did. She proved to be quite valuable in certain respects, as I have said. But she reminds me of the frustration of the savage mind. When we got back to the Three Forks area from which she had been abducted five years previously, we came to the very spot from which she had been kidnapped, and she showed no emotion whatsoever. She was indifferent to this place. That night I wrote in my journal, give her three meals a day and a few trinkets and she would be happy anywhere on earth. This is the savage mind at work. Well, Mr. Clark had more affection for her than I did. In fact, they became good friends. And once when Charbonneau had beaten her, one evening in a camp in Idaho, Clark came to him and said if he ever put his hands on her again, he would personally kill him. And that Christmas, uh, Sakajawea gave Mr. Clark 12 dozen weasel's tails, which is the highest honor that a Shoshone woman can give to a man. When Mr. Clark came back to civilization in 1806, he offered to bring uh, Sakajawea and her child Baptiste and, if necessary, Charbonneau to civilization to educate them. Uh, they declined to do so. But several years later, uh, Sakajawea and her child came down on a steamboat to St. Louis and Mr. Clark undertook to be their protector. Sakajawea was not happy in civilization. Eventually, she wandered back and died of a fever at uh, what's now called Fort Yates, North Dakota. And her son, Baptiste, became one of the great wilderness men in our history. He led expeditions of European nobles up the Missouri. He was an interpreter, and he was an expert woodsman. Uh, so this Indian woman, although she was quite important to the success of our expedition, should not be considered in any sense its guide. We would have prevailed, I think, with or without this squaw. The best thing that she offered to us was her very presence. Because whenever we came into sight of a new Indian tribe, that tribe instantly knew that we were on a peace mission rather than a war expedition, because no Indian people ever carries women into battle. And so when they saw Sakajawea and her child, they realized that this was not a war party. And that on several occasions, I think, if not saved our lives, at least eased the tensions with the natives. Is there a last question before I return you to your business of power? Uh, what became of Captain Clark subsequent to your adventures? <laughs>
as I, as I have said, I committed suicide just three years later. Mr. Clark lived to be a very old man. He became the first Indian trader of northern Louisiana. He lived in St. Louis. He grew extremely rich and very fat and uh, is now remembered by most tribes of the upper Missouri as one of the greatest friends Indians ever had amongst white people. Um, Mr. Clark was what you might call a survivor, and he was able to show flexibility in every enterprise. The great tragedy of our expedition was that the journals were not published because I died before I could bring them to the press. Mr. Clark, if you have ever read the journals, was not a literary man. He couldn't spell. Um, and so he declined to take any responsibility for their publication. It was left to me, therefore, and I died before they came to the press. In fact, I died before I had done anything to prepare them. This left Mr. Jefferson in frustration and in a dilemma how to get this important science into the hands of the American people. He offered it to several people, including Mr. Clark. None would do it. And finally, a man named Nicholas Biddle, a lawyer in Philadelphia, agreed to publish the journals, but he wanted no part of the scientific side of them. So the journals finally came into print in 1813. But the science, the descriptions of over 100 animals and almost 200 plants, the ethnological descriptions of Indian tribes and their languages and their religions and their sexual customs. These things were lost for almost a century. And so most of my pioneering work in natural science was recreated by other naturalists later. And the world of the Enlightenment lost, I think, immeasurably in not having this information at its earliest moment. So that, I think, is the, the greatest failure of the expedition. Mr. Jefferson was quite unhappy with me in my last years because I did not prepare this manuscript for the press. Mr. Clark uh, was interviewed by Nicholas Biddle and offered him an immense amount of oral tradition about his trip through Louisiana, and that is what made the edition in 1813 edited by Mr. Biddle a minor classic. Well, what I want to do now is stop being Meriwether Lewis and just for about three minutes become Clay Jenkinson, the scholar who has portrayed him. I want to give you a chance to ask me a question if you have one, but I want to say, first of all, that I try to portray Lewis as accurately as possible, but you see that he's not particularly a nice man. His attitude towards Indians is very patronizing and condescending. Um, he was a very peculiar man. I think we would call him a manic depressive. Uh, he didn't stand up to the rigors of the Lewis and Clark expedition very well, and if it hadn't been for Clark's more steady temperament, I'm not sure that the expedition would have fared very well. Um, Lewis was drawn to the wilderness. He had some sort of consumptive need to be in wild places, and yet he could never learn to respect the people who lived in the wilderness, the Indians. And that seems to me to be a fundamental contradiction of his personality and perhaps of the American character at, at large. Um, furthermore, Jefferson had this... Uh, this wonderfully benevolent view of Indians, and yet he sent Lewis into their country with a lot of naive notions about Indians which entirely disrupted Indian relations forever. For example, Jefferson thought, no more war. Indians must put down the hatchet. But war was to Indian tribes what Wall Street is to our culture. They couldn't conceive of themselves without that kind of competition. And so by insisting on Jefferson's peace policy, Lewis and Clark in a sense, systematically disrupted the economic and social structure of all the Northwest, and it has never recovered in certain respects. But what I find most fascinating all about, of all about Meriwether Lewis is that moment at the Great Falls when he couldn't describe them. That, it seems to me, to be a quintessential American moment happening very early in our encounters with wilderness. And in my view, this is, this is something that you as legislators might want to think about. Can we... Can we adjust our imagination or our laws to be equal to the magnificence of this continent. Uh, in some sense, we have failed at this over and over and over again, a uh, seminal moment in our national enterprise. Does anyone have a question for me as a scholar before I disappear? Clay Jenkinson, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Ray Jenkinson is not only an actor, but he is a Rhodes Scholar. And Mr. Jenkinson is appearing through the courtesy of the Oregon Committee for the Humanities.